SOS Joe Rogan. So many variations. So little time. What's going on, dude? <laughs> Was that late? <laughs> classic. I mean, clapic. Clapic. One, two, three. I didn't think you were going to actually do it now. I thought it was going to be too late. That was good, though. That was uh, that was sweet comedy. <laughs> so, uh, I, I'm uh, <laughs> I'm Ryan Bill Nitch McKenna, and, and I'm Harland Mondegreen Grant. Uh, and and we're we're doddlers that doddle on a on a podcast entitled the doddlers philosophy. talking today talking about today ryan <laughs> what are we talking about today ryan thanks harlan um <laughs> ah, the, the goofy sillies are out tonight it's the day after halloween what day is it shut up <laughs> um <laughs> well, we're off to a good start we're off to a good start Oh, hello, ladies and gentlemen of the crowd. Um, today's topic, it's kind of, you know, when Montague or whatever his name is over there, when we uh, first started thinking about like, who are we going to talk about doing a podcast or whatever? One of the things we have always mentioned was, like, oh, we got plenty of like articles to, that we can read and talk about if we you know, find them compelling enough or whatever. And of course we've talked about ideas as you all 3.3 and a half listeners are acknowledged or 4.4, whatever it is now. But one of the things that we said, and we've said this because, because I, I got to backtrack a little Harland and I, back when we lived in the same town and even when we haven't lived in the same town, have this little group we call thermic whims with friends who are like minded and we we taught we basically do what we do just he and I but with more people and more belligerence and beer and chips. And so one of the things we've sometimes done is kind of try and find little themes or ways to come up with topics to uh chew the fat about. And one of the things that we've always talked about and we kind of included in this potential list of things we can talk about in the Doddler's Philosophy podcast um, is taking these what are called annual questions. Some, maybe one out of 4.4 listeners knows what I'm about to talk about, but it's this literary agent in particular, I think science literary agent by the name of John Brockman. Um, and he, back in the 80s and 90s, had something called the reality club. It's kind of like their own version of thermic whims, but including reality. And, you know, eventually that kind of transformed the, the kind of activities they would do because they're all like super, you know, rich living in New York, all the famous people, Dan Dennett's one of those that would hang out. Stephen Jay Gould is another. I wouldn't Dawkins want to be and... in any club that has reality as a member. 
And so anyway, we are <laughs> we are uh, talking about this is I, I I love my long lead ups. This is something I I inherited from my mother. Hi, mom. <laughs> anyway, they have these things called annual questions. And they started back in the late 90s when this website called edge.org got going. Sometimes, uh, you know, it's a, these are questions that are posed to the kind of, I don't know, the people in the John Brockman circle, the reality club kind of people. And they got lots of different kinds of questions every year. I think the last one was, what's the last question was like this last year's one, which I don't know if that means they're all getting too old to do this anymore or something, but... So we were like, oh, we can always do one of those questions. And I think recently we just kind of looked at the list and we were like, well, we like maybe three questions, maybe. And so the one we decided is this one that was posed in 2005. And it is, what do you believe is true even though you cannot prove it? And so when that question is posed, typically what happens is all these various people who've been asked to give some kind of response they all write in and give their response to the question and so anyway that is the question what do you believe is true even though you cannot prove it yeah and we're going to talk about that tonight well sort of well maybe nice because i want to oh contrary <laughs> before we get started with that I kind of want to uh, question the question again. Mm. Jesus. Because pretty much every important component of the question I have problems with. <laughs> so before I can even talk about, like, play along and play the game and do it and talk about what I believe is true even though I can't prove it, I have to like reformulate it into a way that is acceptable to this normative meta epistemological skeptic general semantics proponent <laughs> person and i mean some of the real answerers poked at the question a little bit but i have even more things to say about it yes yeah, so some of the answers did poke at it there was like a mathematician who was like, proof? Ah! And then they went on, you know. Yeah, I'm with him on that one. Yeah, but he only chose one word because he's like, I'm a mathematician. We do proofs. Proof! You know, and you sounds like have like the whole block <laughs> you have problems with. Everything must be criticized. Everything must Problematized. Go. Yeah. Um... All right, so where do we start? All right, what do you believe? All right, well, what the hell is that? Belief is a big one. I've typically been the sort of person who might walk around uttering the sentence, well, I don't believe anything. Or, you know, or, <laughs> or think that it is more epistemically responsible or somehow a superior position to at least strive not to have beliefs. But even so, then it's kind of like, well, what is belief mean it's a pretty high level abstraction complicated question some of the more basic candidates i think would be like considers to be true and that sounds like a what they probably mean here given that it reads what do you believe is true even though blah 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 and then as we've talked about in well let me get to the truth i don't know so I know another one could just be like acts as if if it means considers true that's the kind where I'm like I don't really want to do that I don't consider anything to be true if it just means the kind of Dennett intentional stance thing uh, reference to episode 12 where <laughs> to have a belief is to be well described and predicted by attributing a set of beliefs and desires to you then I nor anyone else can probably help that because we're behaving and then some clever scientist can come along and describe our behavior as though it's been motivated by some set of beliefs, but then they have the problem of, well, like, which one? Any given behavior can be described 
by an indefinite number of mutually exclusive doxastic sets that could describe the genesis of that behavior. So, yeah, I know that's a problem, but, you know. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> given that, the way they phrase it is... What do you believe is true? In the I think that probably they just mean more along the lines of what do you consider to be true... And I'm like, well, I don't want to do that, but all right, whatever. Consider to be what? Because <laughs> true is even probably a bigger bag of worms. Can of worms? What do you keep worms in? It's a bag of worms. Uh, I think can cans are, are where where worms come from. Yeah, but now under the Trump tariffs, nobody can afford worm cans anymore, so I have a worm bag. Oh. Wow. Uh -huh. <laughs> We've talked about truth in pretty much every episode that has been my fault, including episode four entirely and directly about truth. And the general attitude that I, and if I may speak for the Dawdler's philosophy, this podcast Ooh. is kind of coming to is that we like to define truth with the classic correspondence theory that to be true is to somehow symbolically represent that which is the case but to follow along quickly behind that definition and say, but none of us likes to take positions regarding the correspondence truth of any given utterance. So, you know, what do I believe is true even though I can't prove it? Well, I'm probably going to want to change truth, as I often do, to something more along the lines of does it have a good argument? Uh, episode 10. And then like this mathematician guy says, I also have a bell go off in my head when I hear the word prove because as this semantic conservative that I tend to be, I'm like, well, yeah, but proof has a perfectly good definition, but it's very specific. It applies all and only to the activities within formal systems like math or logic or these kind of things, where the name of the game is listing off valid deductions of formulas from axioms based on rules of derivation. That's a proof, right? You take A as an axiom and then you say, oh, well, we have the law of non-contradiction, so now I can derive it is not the case that not A or whatever, and you can apply the rules to the things and work your way down. Those are proofs. I think. So, because many English speakers have pulled the word out of that application and started to use it all over the place, I want to resist. Nothing can be proven in that sense that I think is intended by the spirit of the question. But you can just replace that with these persuasive arguments. It's not about proving it, because what does that even mean? And then if you know, then you're like, well, you can't do that. Let's just look for an argument. Is there anything left? By taking it all apart, what do you believe is true even though you can't prove it? Oh, Jesus, there's a bunch of yous in there. Well, you know, I don't exist. Uh -oh. There's no me. What are you talking about? Huh? <laughs> eh? Huh? Eh? No. All right. We're not going to do that. That's too, too, <laughs> much, too much radicalism for one night. I know, and usually we reserve it for the end. But we're just going to go right off the bat and just... Gah! Howard Dean style. So, all right, I won't do that. That's too much. I won't argue that there's no you. But I still want to do something with that aspect and say that I'm not too interested, nor... And I even think this is more in the spirit of what was probably intended by the question. It doesn't really matter whether I can or can't prove something because that's just an arbitrary contingent fact about an inability of me. And I think there's all kinds of stuff that I can't prove, even though I'm convinced that those who ought to know better can. So instead of emphasizing whether or not I can prove it, I think I'd like to back off to just be like, are there good reasons to think that there is an argument for this accessible? Whether or not I feel equipped to make it at any given place and time. So, to wrap it all up, I'd like to rephrase the question, Judge. Do it. So, I think we should turn 
What do you believe is true even though you cannot prove it? Into the question, What claims do you accept with a higher degree of confidence than you suspect that there are currently constructible good arguments in favor of? To me, that backs us out of all of these bear trap concepts that could potentially undermine the entire project, but still basically gets at the spirit of what we're doing, right? What claims do you accept with more confidence than you think you ought to based on the arguments you're aware of or whatever, you know? What do you think of that, like, rephrase? I like it. But to be honest with you, there is one part that I just want to ask about, and it is the currently constructible, is that, you know, I think one mm -hmm. of the things about these questions is that there's a brevity to them. There's a sort of fast, actionable ability for someone to drop that sentence into the uh, neck tap, as you and Dan Dennett like to say, and then just, you know, go with it from there. But I, 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 when I get to currently constructible, I'm like, what was the beginning of the sentence? Is there a way that you would feel comfortable condensing that even further? Right. Like, what would be the shorter hand, just even if it means subtracting some words, what words would you get rid of in that sentence? Yeah, I'm happy. I mean, I agree with you that as phrased, it's a mouthful. One thing that's difficult about it is to pull that out and not replace it with some sort of personal subjective construction. That we don't want to go back to claims that you accept with a higher degree of confidence than you can argue for, or something like that. So, uh -huh. you could say something like, claims that you accept with a higher degree of confidence than you suspect there are good arguments for? Yeah, that's... That's faster. I mean, that, that I, I hold on to what claims do you accept by the time you're at good arguments for. Mm -hmm. So let's say that then. <laughs> Sounds good. So, Harlan, do you have any claims that you accept with a higher degree of confidence than you suspect there are good arguments for? Of course not. What do you think I am? <laughs> I'm, ep I'm entirely epistemically responsible. <laughs> All right. Well, then I guess it's just on me then. Um, no, I, I came up with few. Okay, I want you to begin because I, I'm guessing when you say few, that's more than I have. Okay, let me start with this one. I think it's relatively interesting. I've got some pushback on it before, but I still feel mm. this way. I still, you know, I mean, that's what we're all about, right? We're going to think around here. So it's kind of a multi-part one, but... The way it often comes up and is phrased is as a response to the question, we did alien considerations mm. recently. Well, let's say that an alien did okay. come down and that it was clever enough because we wouldn't be right away, that we'd be in the, what is that recent one with the Amy Adams and stuff where they squirt the ink circles? Arrival. Arrival. Yeah, the, the humans would be having a hard time trying to figure it out. But let's say that the aliens are clever enough that they develop a communication method or a translation method so that we can talk to each other. A question is, do you think that there would be any concepts, claims, ideas, technologies, social strategies, whatever, that there would be some sort of concepts that the aliens would have and utilize and would even maybe just be common sense to them by now, but that human beings could never understand. There's just some lack in either the English language or in our brains it, that there are inaccessible concepts to me. I, <laughs> what am I supposed to say? That's a claim that I suspect uh -huh. is wrong, I think, that there are no concepts inaccessible to me. But I also don't think that there are great arguments for that right now. And I could easily be wrong, but I still want to hold on. I still think that. That if I were talking to the aliens, there's nothing that I couldn't grok. That's interesting. I think I, of course, would fall on the other side, as I probably naturally do on these subjects. I am much more, the picture is incomplete and at it could it could be incomplete because I'm not saying it would be incomplete forever. 
but I would just say that at the beginning and within your fucking lifetime that it would not, you wouldn't be able to understand it. Maybe five generations later we would or something like that, or, or maybe three years. I don't know. But like right away, Harlan's in the ship in arrival and they're just trying to com- communicate some concept. And uh, no matter how hard you try, you just don't get it. I'm open to that possibility. I don't have a very good argument for that other than the one that we kind of threw around in the aliens episode, which was this sample size of N equals one. We use just ourselves and communicating with ourselves as a means to extrapolate out. We use essentially a single data point, And then from there we get everything. That's the only thing that kind of stops me up. It's sort of that, well, it has to be carbon based and yours is, is not the same, but it still feels like you're pulling from the same thing. The other thing I would then say would be, are, is, are we doing this? Is that okay if I'm like throwing this stuff out there and then you can try and, I don't know. I don't know. We didn't really talk about what we do once we threw it out there, but I'm just going to go with this. All is permitted. Uh, it, does it have to be something above you? Or is it possible that there's like some kind of, you know, like, could it be an organism that doesn't use like spoken language or whatever? Could there be quote unquote, like concepts that an octopus or whatever is, is attempting to communicate to you, but you just don't get, maybe it's the idea of the lost Amazonian tribes thing that we were talking about where it's like, you just don't even, or the Phil niche theory thing where it's just like, you don't even get what you don't get. Like you need to be really clever. You need to probably be lucky and, you know, to be able to go, wait a minute, I, I'm catching a signal. You know, be all Star trek You know, I'm catching a, some in piece of information's not jiving with other stuff. And holy shit, now look at this. You know, we've got these invisible space leeches on our face, like in that Voyager episode. Anyway, you know, that kind of thing. Or maybe it was the one with Data and he has the telephone in his stomach. And everybody's having these weird dreams. And it's because, like, there's some kind of invisible... Anyway. <sighs> So that's all I'm trying to say is that we have this really small sample size. I'd like to see you, if if octopi have concepts, I'd like to see you grok that. And then we could start to say, oh, okay, well, maybe, you know, know, does your dog, does does Knox have concepts, you think? And he's a mammal, so you might be able to say, well, we evolved and, you know, we have have a shared ancestry more recent and or something like that. But I'm trying to find something that's like, you know, like people love to talk about that the cephalopods because they're sort of just they're so alien you know or whatever anyway what do you think this is one of the reasons why these sorts of questions i think can be a lot of fun like the edge question that we kind of start with and then we modify and then we attempt to address and already there's like a dozen (laughs) things that i want to talk about real quick terminological thing in the first place i don't know how many people do or don't know what grok means as i understand it it comes from the robert heinlein novel stranger in a strange land where we have an alien visitation and (laughs) there's questions about it's 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 sort of supposed to mean something deeper than mere understanding right it basically means understanding but like a thorough understanding with your cognitive faculties and your emotions and just it's just this really deep and complete understanding that's what it means right yeah i always thought it was like just yeah i don't know if i'm going off the rails here but i always heard the term used when somebody's playing a video game and you're watching them play it it's like you can see you know what i mean what they're experiencing because you're not playing against them focusing on your guy and trying to you know you're literally like with them you know sort of being john malkovich or whatever i don't know if that's also a kind of play on the basic idea and then you just kind of expand it out into these other areas you know mission creep kind of thing anyway i that sounds good that it's immersive yeah immersive yeah you're just sort of like you know Oh, the person's walking around the hallways in a video game with a gun or something, and they're shooting zombies. And you're just watching them play. Or if you go to YouTube, you can watch literally video games. Yeah. And you do, you've do. you done stuff like this where people literally watch you play. 
right? With you, mm-hmm. you had a team and you guys were out there and people were just, and I don't know, I find it enjoyable too. I don't, anyway, so yeah. I don't know how often we use these terms that uh, four out of our 4.4 people are like, what, what? What are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, sure. So anyway, that's what we mean with this guac term. That it's a it's understanding, but even better. It's really understanding squared. Okay. <laughs> so one of the things that you're bringing up is between humans and cephalopods or something like that. And okay, so I'm a Quinean indeterminacy of translation type guy. I don't think that anyone ever grocks anyone else, even you and I both speaking English as well as we do, to mm. each other. Sure. I don't think grocking happens, period, ever. You know. So there's that. And then there's the radical aspect of if it were I trying to understand the dolphins, the whales, the octopi, whatever, that I would not even be able really to get started And if I did, I would just be doing some sort of behavioristic analysis. You know, you kind of start by trying to figure out if they have ascent and descent, and then asking yes or no questions over and over again to try to learn a few basic terms and then work from that basis and whatever. It's all very difficult and questionable. So that's why I wanted to stress, I wanted to reduce that aspect by offloading this onto the extraterrestrial stellar travelers. Let's assume or pretend that they are smarter than we and have solved these sorts of problems. They have a Douglas Adams babble fish or whatever that they can drop in your ear, and it. they have technology that is able to translate between languages. I wanted to minimize that problematic in order to make the conceptual claim about whether or not there would be ideas that I couldn't understand if we didn't worry about the translation aspect. There's going to be linguistic aspects. I see, I see, right. And then we've got the, Duh. what I consider trivial. This part's just trivial. <laughs> of course, there may be ideas that I could never understand if, for example, they took longer to express than my lifespan. But that's not what I mean. Yeah. When I say can't understand. Right. You're in so the also I want to take that off of there. Let's mm-hmm. say I can live forever. Foreshadowing to a later claim. <laughs> Let's say I can live whatever. Take that one off. Some of the sub claims that I think I would want to make, which also would probably count as things, as claims that I would buy into beyond what I might be able to argue for well, mm-hmm. would be that English is unlimited maybe in an analogous sense to how we might think that number theory or something is has all arithmetic truths in it or something. I think that languages as extensive and living and changeable and you can coin new terms and you can do anything as fancy and advanced as English can say all cons that there's nothing ineffable in English would be another claim that I would tend to like but not be confident I could argue for. That's a sub claim, though, you're saying as well, right? Yeah, part of the you can, you know, I think you need that one in order to get to the alien grokken claim. That sounds like some kind of Chomskyan thing, right? That's not where I would attribute it. I don't know. Maybe. What do you mean? Someone like Stephen Pinker likes to talk about sort of the infinite power of language. Uh, he actually says infinite combinatorial power. But there is a specific phraseology that Chomsky actually says, and I don't remember if, off the top of my head right now, which sucks. But anyway, obviously it's not a big deal. It would have been awesome if I could have just like thrown it <laughs> out there and been like, like this, Ireland? And you've been like, wow, Ryan, you're so knowledgeable. Except there is no knowledge claims. Anyway, let's do this. No, you're just an erudite motherfucker. All right. <laughs> yeah. Were, are you still trying to finish this Chomsky thing? <laughs> um, uh, uh, I keep continue. I this one, I am. I more feel that I would su- suspect that there are good arguments in its favor, but 
I also would be a fan of the claim that our symbolic capacities are that which make us special, sets us apart from the other non-symbolic animals, and that <laughs> the and that there's something really special, unique, different about being able to have purely arbitrary and indefinitely extendable symbol systems. And that we, as human animals, do seem to have that ability, that I'm unaware of any persuasive arguments that any other earthbound animals have them, but that if any did, then we should be able to exchange all of our concepts with them, and then if there were an extraterrestrial symbol, symbolic species mm. that we ever encountered, that we should be able to mutually, completely exchange our conceptual schemes. Okay. By the way, I found that thing. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, okay, say it now, and then you can go uh, back and cut and paste. Jesus, Where, exactly. what do you, okay, say uh, 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 You mean... Uh, Wilhelm von Humboldt's infinite use of finite means, Harlan? Precisely. <laughs> Cut and paste. No. All right. I don't know anything about that. But it sa that phrase sounds good. Yeah, sounds great. Sounds infinite. Okay, continue. Oh, well, that's it. I kind of have made and repeated the claim a couple of times. Okay, I don't know you if you have anything more to say about it. But that's just a thing that I find interesting. I tend to buy that claim, but I also not so sure there's great arguments for it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'll just, you know, provisionally accept those because, you know, of the scope we're in right now, rather than go down another road. Because I think you have a few ones you want to put out there, and I want to hear them. <laughs> and then I'm just like, and four hours later, we're still going on about symbols and its significance. Not that I'm not saying it's not significant. <coughs> Is it my turn so, to throw? So, okay, yeah, if, you wanna, if you've got one and want to go. Yeah, yeah, I've got one. I have two. Yours are sound so much more, like, profound. Um, <laughs> mine are just Big surprise. Like, I know. Well, <laughs> I don't know. I didn't say I know that. Jesus Christ, Ryan. Pay attention. All right. Um, okay, so here's one that I have. And in the spirit of the rephrasing, you know, what claims do you accept with a higher degree of confidence than you suspect there are good arguments for? I hope that these fall into that kind of way. I was, I was thinking about it earlier, and I was trying to... I was trying to think about what are the things that... You know, I just think and and uh, that don't dink. Um, so here's one. Uh, I think that detecting life as we know it, whatever that is, biological systems, carbon-based, within our solar system, detecting life as we know it within our solar system, wouldn't make significant inroads to extinguishing our sort of existential status of, quote-unquote, being alone in the universe. Life on Mars wouldn't mean anything to the question, is there life in the universe? Initial, like, gut thing that I have about that is that it's just too close. Like, if the universe is as big as they say, then who fucking cares? I mean, Jesus Christ, we're all down here on Earth, like, sneezing our asses off and farting and shitting all over the place. Some of that goo is about to get somewhere else, or maybe it's something that happened that's sort of inherent to our little solar system. So you go to Europa, and, oh, look, we found carbon-based life. I don't think anyone should be like, yeah! I think they should just be like, well, it's so localized here. Like, just the fact that, you know, we're uh, in this solar system, I just don't think that would mean anything. I, I would okay. not be excited Clarify. about Clarify. Okay. When you started expressing this, I thought that you were going to be making a social psychological claim okay. that... If we found microbes on Mars, most humans on Earth 2018 wouldn't give a shit about that. It I mean, wouldn't change anything. They might not. But then as you continued to talk, I thought that you were shifting more towards being some sort of 
scientific, biological, astrobiological claim about if we found microbes on Mars, that you think the default hypothesis or the one that you would favor offhand would be that it stemmed from the same origin. Yeah, or, yeah, But exactly. that or, somehow was dispersed a, amongst more than one planet in our solar system. But you don't think that discovery of microbes on Mars would establish extraterrestrial life in the sense of it arising more than once. Right. You like would default it, to being that was a share, you know, we came from the same tree. I would think, yeah, that's that would be the claim that I can't really support with a good argument. That I would, I, because I just think it. I don't really sit there and, and go, whoa, Ryan, I don't ask myself questions about it. I don't spend much time on it. I just, anytime anyone's like, oh, let's, you know, you're the little robots on, you know, the rovers and stuff on Mars are like digging through the soil desperately looking for life, you know, signs of life. I'm just like, who cares? Like, what is that really ultimately going to say for both the astrobiological questions and for, you know, the are we alone in the universe? If you can determine that it was sort of spontaneously, forming then maybe that's uh significant but just my hunch based off of like all explanations for how like the solar system formed for all the um things like that mars rock that was in is i think it was antarctica you know when it was during the clinton uh, presidential you know uh administration and uh you know everybody thought oh we found life maybe and you know what I mean? Like, it's just, and, and the, the other thing is, is that there was another astrobiologist lady who, I think she was in Mono Lake, and there was something about, um, uh, hold on, uh, anthrax or something like that, some kind of base like that, um, or some kind of molecular basis like that, that was part of their DNA, I think she was saying, something along those lines, or cyanide or something. And she was saying it's wholly different and independent, and they use a very different way to make cellular transactions and stuff like that and or intracellular transactions and then it turns out no it it it, it was like just you know she upon looking deeper it, it you know people realized that there wasn't any real significance to what she was claiming or whatever so that also then every time we go out and we think we found something really really radically different or whatever it rarely is and so it's just all that little stuff that kind of comes into my head. These aren't, I don't have any formulation of an argument or anything. I just, it just, I'm like, eh, I don't think it would mean anything, both astrobiologically or whatever, and like existentially as well. Like we shouldn't get our hopes up. You know, we shouldn't jump to any conclusions right. if they find we're life not alone. Them. Yeah, exactly. It's like, well, it's probably us. You know, I mean, if a rock we're can land still on the us, one and, tree in the desert. And it's not that there's a forest over the horizon that we haven't seen yet. Even if we found solar system life, it's mm -hmm. probably just the result of the same tree. And that it was spread around by some sort of asteroid impact sneeze right. analogy like you were saying. Yeah, exactly. That sounds plausible to me. Again, unfortunately... We won't be able to go back and forth on this for 45 minutes because I think I would tend to favor that hypothesis also. Oh. <laughs> I guess, you know, like you, were, you probably already mentioned, depending on the details, if right. we found solar system life that appeared radically different genetically or that it didn't even have what we would r recognize as genes or right. whatever, right. then that would be better. Yeah. But if we found it and it resembled us significantly, it also seems to me relatively safe to start with the assumption. Yeah, it's probably just the same tree of life. It's probably us. Yeah, where well, we could probably even track some common ancestry potentially, you know, or whatever. Mm -hmm. With the big data algorithms we have today. So, yeah, that's kind of what I was... That's sort of what I'm thinking. So it would be, it, I used to think when I was younger anyway, that, ooh, my, wouldn't that be amazing? Because I think I just had the assumption that it would just be completely spontaneous in its separateness from us, and that would be awesome. But I just, now that people have just continued to study the formation of the solar system, I, I don't know, it just seems to me like, 
there's a lot of movement and a lot of changes. And then all the additional things they keep kind of coming up with, like there's like p potential, like there's this one uh, theoretical planet that's out there, but it can't be out there unless there's another one. And that other one goes with this completely crazy orbit around um, the sun that's totally not on the same plane, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and it's just like oh yeah you know what i mean it's like okay mm -hmm. well they just they're not done so I, I you know it sounds to me like things are rollicking pretty good right now in our understanding of of this little solar system and the the role the Uruk cloud might play and you know it, pluto's in pluto's out it's just like jesus christ they find life on mars the next planet over i'm not going to be like oh my god it's happening you know like it's that's my thinking anyway Sometimes I'm surprised to realize how still, from future perspectives, in which dark ages we still remain. <laughs> that, and of course, in medicine, that's very common. Like, wait, we don't know what the appendix is yet? What? <laughs> yeah. Like, how dumb are we? We don't know what planets are and where and what their plane of orbit is in relation to us? Jesus Christ. I know. We're morons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so anyway that was that was one of one of mine lots of edge.org respondents talked about alien life i know we, so many so do we. i would say the two most common themes i think they did 120 respondents and as i was reading through them the ones that at least stuck on my stack memory stack the most were um various things about aliens, and then the human brain, right? The brain thinks it's the greatest thing in the universe, yeah. and all these people have brains, and they're like, I love that shit. oh, man, <laughs> the brain is so cool. Somebody, I think, even said, I, the claim that I'm confident about but can't prove is that the brain, the human brain, is the fanciest artifact in the universe. And I'm just like, what the hell? That is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. You have no reason to think that. At, uh, like, that is, oh my God. I don't know how anyone can be that <sighs> anthropocentric and egotistical or whatever. Like, Jesus Christ. Luckily, Fucking... they're not listening to this, but come on. <laughs> I hope well, am do. I the only one who thinks that's a stupid thing to say? No, no, I'm, I'm with you. All right, so yeah, that's uh, so. Is that wait a minute though? You're just that's just a fun anecdote from them. That's not your claim. <laughs> Why? Would oh, they, right. You know? I was just remarking on it's that yours was kind of a oh, extraterrestrial yeah. life thing, and I was like, lots and lots of people talked about that. Yep. That's a place many people go. Yeah. When I leave the planet, <laughs> I my next claim that I tend to accept but cannot argue for is, as you were mentioning, a little more grandiose than that. Um, do we still think, or is it still scientific orthodoxy, to think that we're in a heat-death universe? Right, like, some people think it's bang crunch or whatever, and then the other people are like, well, so there's a couple steady-staters around, but a lot of people seem to think, at least at a time, and I don't know how popular it is nowadays, that there's this... Arrow of time determined by the measure of entropy in the universe. Entropy is always increasing in a closed system. The universe, almost by definition, is a closed system. And therefore, eventually, it will reach a state of maximum entropy where everything is as chaotic as it can possibly be. And nothing interesting will ever again happen in that universe. And they call that the heat death Right. Do I have any of this right? Yeah, thanks, Lawrence Krauss. That's the Lawrence Krauss picture? Well, that's the uh, one that he, I've heard him talk about, and he's like, and then we're all gone. And, and then everything is gone. We're gone, and every all the aliens are gone, and everything is gone. Galaxies can't even see each other. With that as the background, yes. here's the claim. Technology is unlimited. Intelligence is unlimited. A sufficiently advanced society could reverse entropy in the universe and prevent heat death. Bam! Bam! 
Yeah, I like that one. I can't fight with you on that one. I I just, uh, ever since the universe invented imagination, it just didn't know what it had coming. Or the universe invented imagination to stop heat death. Yeah, something like that. I I agree. Uh, it's uh, even if, well, I don't know if, if the technology would be to somehow, you know, hold back the universe or to somehow, you know, find a way to collect the things in it so that they didn't spread out or whatever. You know what I'm saying? Like, also, I don't, I mean, if there is like, if it's more than one universe, even though I know that's mostly just apparently theory, but if say, if there was more than one universe, then maybe there'd be ways that we could interact with others and learn. And there's just so many, by the time you're getting to like, <laughs> to discuss that problem, you're, you're already there as far as we're concerned, like you and I and science 2018 on earth. I mean, obviously we as a, not even type one civilization. Dang right. Are are pretty far away from being able to technologically prevent entropic heat death. But that doesn't mean it can't be done. It just can't be done by us. Because we suck at most things. <laughs> but yeah, I I mean that would be that would be the claim, I think. If I'm even speaking in a parlance that is still in 2018 scientifically respectable which itself i don't even, i'm not even confident that this phraseology is still used but i've encountered it in various books at various times and i'm still stuck there because as a philosopher we don't fucking know what's going on anywhere else but that i would want the claim would be that entropic heat death is technologically preventable by intelligence and so something that's less radical about this is don't i get to rope in the whatever number law it is that says energy can't be created or destroyed. Oh, yeah, the laws of conservation. So that one seems to be potentially on my side. It's just that, because then the question is the distribution of the energy, right? And maybe in its, in a quote-unquote natural state, we're on this arrow of increasing entropy where the distribution of energy in universe is relatively chaotic and random and increasing but if it can't be destroyed it's all still there and it's all still manipulable right so get smart people and mm. intelligently alter the distribution of mass energy in space time until you arrive at a steady, you, you know, like maybe we create a steady state universe out of one, which was default Big Bang to heat death universe. But if we get powerful and clever enough, why can't we turn it into a indefinitely extendable steady state? What if you're totally correct? But what we don't realize is there's some concept we have yet to be able to grok and some of these guys want to accelerate the entropy because i don't know but what if that was what if it is a steady state and what they're actually trying to do is get it to go or something well then we've got the plot we can actually give star wars a plot then or something yeah because it doesn't have one now apparently uh but you know that sounds like a good description of the enemy yeah, that does. And then Sweet. there'd be a uh, a nice little struggle there that you could uh, turn into some plot arcs and whatnot. Yeah, I, I the enemy though has to like just because I'd I'd rather instead of it be a serious movie, I'd rather it be a Mel Brooks style, and then the enemy <laughs> right they all just are goofy and their eyes are crossed all the time and they just run around and they're just like Ooh. anyway, it's got to be that way. Anyway, um, <clears throat> yeah. So, all right, you don't have anything, you don't have any complaints about that one. Nice. <laughs> what about just the claim that nothing is impossible given sufficient technology? So how about one of the people in this, I don't know if I wrote it down so that I would remember. Oh, I think it was Kurzweil that said, right? For example, 
faster than light communication, he thinks, should be possible. And I'm like, yep, let's, why not? <laughs> so I'm saying no limits, no technological limits, including the speed of light, including you name it. Do you have any problems with that one? No, just because it's like, okay, go ahead, have your no limits technology. I think that kind of a claim is beyond the bounds upon which, I think anyway, the practical skeptical types could really say anything about. I mean, what would, I mean, they could try, but it wouldn't, I, I, they would just have to be like, well, okay, you know. Like, I, I'm not quite, I mean, you can, we can talk about limits, but always, you know, with respect to what's not happening for us right now, what troubles we're having and what, whatever it is, like we're limited by our ignorance or something like that. And we just have to get over that hump and then we won't be limited by it anymore. You know, that kind of thing. Like it's always provisional. It's always temporary. And, but I think a lot of times we just have, are we nearsighted or farsighted if we can't see far? I don't remember. Farsighted? Anyway, mm, I don't know which one it is. I oh yeah. You wear glasses. That counterintuitive to me as well. Anyway, it's whatever. Four point four listeners. It's whatever that is. You can't see far. You know, you're just focusing on like what's right in front of your nose. And but if you were to be able to get somebody to kind of just acknowledge, you know, pretend, you know, you're an alien species that is, you know, way beyond our technological capabilities or something like that, then your little problems aren't worth referencing now. You know what I mean? Like, that's all I'm trying to say is it, it just goes above and beyond. And then you're just kind of in that realm and you're like, okay, that's my thinking anyway. Right. I guess this is kind of a sub claim of another one. And maybe so that would maybe even falsify my claim that this one isn't well arguable for, because I think that the following claim can be, well argued, anything is possible. Oh, yeah, that one. You like that one a lot. I like that one a lot. But that one basically, to me, has an epistemic argument, and it becomes transmogrified into the claim, no one ever has a good reason to assert an impossibility. And then we just say that that's whatever it is whatever the logical term for that rephrase is, that that's saying the same thing. Yeah, it is. It's just you, when you say it the first way, the epistemic way, um, then... It has a tacit clause on the beginning that runs, as far as I know, <laughs> anything is possible. I'm not actively and positively asserting that everything is possible. I'm just saying, I'm not willing to call anything impossible so in that sense, as far as I'm concerned, anything's possible. I think that's, I think you did a good job arguing for that one. Or you can, and it sounds like you, if you wanted to just lift off on that, you could. So I don't know if that necessarily falls into the same grouping as this question is asking. Yeah. yeah the, but what kind of does and extends, yeah, <clears throat> since I already know that you only have one more, I'm kind of <laughs> throwing out a few. Yeah, can right? do it, yeah. Oh, one that's related to this and is related to another one of the respondents, Rupert Sheldrake, mm. who himself is potentially part of the future of this podcast. We're having him on or something? No, I'm joking. <laughs> nah, we don't have guests. Fuck them. Yeah. We don't need them. We'll just talk about their ideas. All they do is eat our food and drink our wine. Let's see if we can get your chimp up on this claim. All right. <laughs> that Sheldrake kind of... He has a different spin on a way, but the way I would just say it is, there are no laws of nature. <laughs> That's great. No, that doesn't get my chimp out, goddammit. Um, <laughs> We've spoken for too many years and become too agreeable, because, you know, reasonable people can't disagree. Uh, no, it's not that. It's just that I once had something to say about the laws, and I said it to to you once and you were like yeah and then now i don't remember what it was <laughs> oh it was something about how laws come out come about because at the time or maybe it was something to do with the fact that people were religious oh that what we call natural laws are a grandchild of divine command yeah laws. right that, that which god decrees and then 
this species of monkeys who believes in that god is willing to say, yeah, nobody mm-hmm. can uh, break God's laws. Right. Then we stop believing in God, like Nietzsche says, and then we, but we want to keep that institution of there being inviolable universals. So then we just say, well, they're not God's laws, they're nature's laws. Yeah. Wow. I couldn't have said it better myself, <laughs> and I didn't. But that was the idea. <laughs> Thanks for uh, giving me. Yeah. I, I, I like that idea, and that as a <laughs> sort of, credit. <laughs> you know, Nietzschean genetics of where natural law comes from. I don't know if it would hold up if you wrote a whole dissertation about it or not. Someone probably has. Yeah. But it has a surface plausibility to me that that's where our tendency, our habit of positing laws comes first from religion, from mm-hmm. religious impulse. Surface plausibilities. <laughs> That's what we're going for on the Doddler's Philosophy. <laughs> we only got two hours. So Sheldrake's spin on this is that he uses the term habit instead. And I kind of right. like that. It's kind of organismal, which is out of fashion or whatever. But that what other people are calling laws, Sheldrake calls habits, that they become somehow... It's more of an evolutionary picture. That as stuff is happening universally, whatever that is, that various tendencies become prevalent and maybe they self-sustain, maybe they influence each other, and then we kind of calcify into these habits that don't appear to change very fast or very often, at least from the perspective of human beings, but our perspective, very limited. Well, so... and. Yeah. No, no, go ahead. And what? I don't know. (laughs) Nice. It's like, it's a different way to say um, because you can't say you know and um too many times. Sometimes you add a different conjunction and hope that your brain will come up with something to say by the time you're done. Uh, Um and you know are like, oh, sometimes I'm like, is that every other word? Sometimes I go um, you know, a lot. So I'm like, um, you know, uh, and then I'll say something, you know, and then um, (laughs) anyway. It's all right. Anyway. Um, did I just, I was like, um, <laughs> fuck. And it's funny because like, I'm probably one of the, I say it a lot to myself, but when people say, I mean, and then they go into, usually it's like an interview in like some kind of like locker room. It's after the game or it's before the game, <laughs> whatever the hell it is. And the inner, you know, this the journalist, the beat reporters like ask the person a question, and they just immediately go, "I mean," and then they start saying something. I'm like, "What do you mean? You mean you didn't say? You could just say something, and then they need to be clarified, and then you say, "I what I mean is," and then the shorthand of that is, "I mean," <clears throat> and here I am going like, "Um, you know, you know, um." So whatever. Uh, the fuck were you trying to say? What I was trying to say before I interrupted myself and then just kept on going, was I recall in the past me saying tendency and you getting all up on my back about that, and I being like, Jesus Christ, tendency I can't even use? And then I'm not saying I need permission from you, but like in your presence, tendency doesn't work for you. And But you're okay with habit. And I'm like, people biting their nails is a habit, you know, and... I just, it it has such a negative connotation uh, at times. It also has, uh, as you said, an organismal connotation. And for those reasons that it's so married to those things, I don't like habit. I'm just like, come on, man. And also it gives this additional, what I don't like about the idea of habit is that it kind of smacks, and this is probably going to help me in your case, when someone says there are habits of the universe, it's like someone being like, the whole universe is conscious or whatever. Like, it's that kind of Ooh. wishy-washy shit. And I'm just like, shut the fuck up. Come on. God damn it. <laughs> Tendencies is a sort of removed, I don't know, uh, when I try and gather information about it. This is more than this most of the time. You know, like, that's what I'm looking for. I'm not looking for habit. I think... 
I, he likes that phrase because it's colorful and, and poetic in a way. Um, and it gives this sort of endearing quality to nature. You know, oh, nature has habits. Well, yeah, he's a basically a what a, a I know. pan biologist. Or he wants to hold a new science of life mm-hmm. or whatever his book was called. He's all about the whole universe being alive in some sense. And you know, of course, then it would have habits. Morphogenetic, blah blah blah. Uh, resonance, morphogenetic well, resonance, morphic resonance. Yeah, oh, yeah um, that's right. Harland. November 2018, likes tendency. So I don't know <laughs> what earlier version you hadn't oh updated your software yet, but I'm fine with tendency. That's good. So and it sounds like you just have some connotative pollution with habit, and that's fine. Yeah. I like that we throw around your phrase, connotative pollution. That's a good one. I'm going to make it a thing. It, or, this is going to be a thing. Or was that what we're calling them now? I thought they were memes. That's another yeah. one because I, I I just a thing I mean, is a relatively successful meme, so it's oh, all memes. Oh. We're bouncing memes around, but then some memes do well temporarily, and while they're doing well, we say that that meme is a thing. Mm. Mm. In a highly colloquial manner. Sweet. Next topic. Is it me now? Is it my yes. last one? Sort of. Do it. This one is like my last one. I thought was sort of small potatoes. <laughs> this is, is like, this even smaller? So much smaller! It's hilarious. Oh my god! I know. <laughs> I know. I'm like you're all like we're universe. You know, we're gonna fix heat death. Yeah. There's no laws. Everything, no laws. Anything's possible. <laughs> Infinite. And now it's like put on the elevator music. Here we go. I feel embarrassed just like saying because these are the things that I ponder. I'm like, oh, this is cool. No, it's it's fine. It's gonna be great. <laughs> okay. Um, You're all right. I've been meaning to make a pun off the heat death thing with you turning off your heater in the little shack there. <sighs> but uh, I just haven't found it yet. Okay. All right, here we go. You ready? <laughs> Jesus Christ. This one is so I'm small. I'm sitting down. I should have started with this one, and then we got up to heat death. <sighs> it's physics, though, sort of. Yeah, I mean, of course it is. <clears throat> so, I got, actually, I'm not going to read it. I'm, I'm going to give this one a little lead in, like you've been doing. Uh, so, this one's about... <laughs> this one's a geological one. And it's sort of... It's just a pattern I noticed uh, looking at, um, you know, sort of a plot of, uh, I'm in the Pacific Northwest of the United States of America to the Republic for which I stand. Um, And I was looking at just the map. uh, It's like it was like a topic relief map. So for those people, it's like, looks, you can see the mountains and the river valleys and stuff. And I was looking at the Cascade Volcanoes. So in the Pacific Northwest, running north-south, kind of, you know, relatively even distance from the coast, from uh, way northern Washington down to way northern California, is just dotted along, uh, more or less in a line, these they used to be called, well, some people probably still do call them stratovolcanoes. I learned them as being called composite cones, meaning they're just comprised of various different kinds of eruptive materials, and they still form this big old cone. So near where I live, there's one called Mount Hood and another one called Mount St. Helens. Mount St. Helens erupted quite uh, uh, violently, at least as far as we're concerned around uh, the United States and whatnot. And uh, it was in 1980. Anyway, there's Mount Adams. Mount Rainier, I think, is the largest Cascade volcano. Anyway, it goes down. There's Mount Jefferson. There's a really large park, national park, called Crater Lake. And that's a collapsed volcano after an eruption. And so you just have this caldera that's there. And it's filled up with water ever since. It's a lake now. Anyway. And then down into... California, there's Medicine Lake, there's another volcano, and then there's uh, Lassen Peak. Way to the north, you got 
Glacier Peak and Mount Baker. And that's north of like Seattle even. So this mountain range or this volcanic arc, I was just noticing, but there are these two significant gaps between <laughs> Harlan just probably like gone out to go take a leak and he's just like chatting with his family and he's like, yeah, no, we're just doing whatever. Anyway, between Mount Rainier and Glacier Peak and between Medicine Lake and Crater Lake, there's a gap and I haven't measured it or anything yet which I probably should at some point just for fun when I have the spare time. But the distance between those mountains, those two sets of mountains, is larger than the distance between any other. Just looking at it. And I'm sure measuring it would be also the same. Or just going to Google Maps and saying, what's the distance? Anyway. And literally just west, adjacent to both of those gaps, is what are known as accreted terrains which all throughout the Pacific Northwest, there are these accreted terrains as, here's, here's the lesson, folks, as a oceanic crust, because, you know, there's rocks down there, is moving along and being subducted under a continental crust, like the one I'm sitting on, and the one probably anyone else who's listening is, well, maybe someone's on an island. But most people, we live on the continents. So ocean crust gets subducted under the continental crust. And sometimes what happens is volcanic rocks and uh, islands form like Hawaii or something like that out deeper uh, or out further in the ocean. But they get carried along as the crust moves and as the convergence of the two different uh, the oceanic crust and plate, if you will, that's also what it's known as, and the continental plate, say, North America, com- converge. And they just literally, like, you're, if you were to take your hands and have one pointed down and one pointed more or less straight across, and you were to bring them together, it'd be like if your fingertips rubbing against your knuckles were scraping off your skin, and that skin got attached to your fingertips. That's the idea of an accreted terrain, is this large body of eruptive material that is sitting on an oceanic plate or slab or whatever you want to call it, and it literally just gets stuck because it can't get subducted under. But there are these big blocks of their own thing that, you know, and this whole, you know, Pacific Northwest has just got a bunch of them. The Wallawas are an accreted terrain, the Blue Mountains in Oregon are accreted terrain, the Olympic Mountains are an accreted terrain. The Klamath Mountains are an accreted terrain. And so just directly west of these gaps, the one between Medicine Lake and Crater Lake, is the Klamath Mountain Range, the accreted terrain. And then just north of it, uh, or just to the north, the North Gap, I guess I could call it, between Mount Rainier and Glacier Peak, is the Olympic Mountains. Oh, and by the way, if you ever look at Vancouver Island, that big island, that's that's a terrain, and it's going to get accreted eventually onto North America. But right now, there's a little bit of water between the North American continent and the Vancouver Island. Anyway, um, so uh, my claim, <laughs> if, I, if I may, is that the Olympic and Klamath Mountains... Uh, accreted terrains are kind of impeding the Juan de Fuca uh, slab, which is this small little remnant slab of what was a much larger uh, plate that formed the Sierra Nevada range. Um, and it was going even back to the time of the dinosaurs. So the Olympic and Klamath Mountains accreted terrains are impeding the Juan de Fuca slab I don't know exactly how. Uh, that's why there's a gap, though, because uh, between the two mountains, between, say, you know, again, the, the north gap and the south gap that I guess I'll be calling now. Um, and I don't know exactly why, but it would be disrupting what our model is, at least, of how we get these volcanic arcs in the first place, which is that the subducting slab, oceanic slab as it gets crammed into the mantle and there's all this crazy physics of pressure and temperature going on, 
it essentially what happens is it dewaters that slab, that pressure, that temperature. So any water that's in the rocks gets lost and water will lower the melting point of the surrounding rocks, which will create this sort of molten body that's melting because the water is being lost as it's being subducted. That molten body then due to buoyancy, like when you boil water or convection in the atmosphere, you know, it's just a density current, if you will. Um, the buoyancy it will rise up through various, uh, you know, releases of pressure and cracks and whatnot and come up and then be erupted at the surface. So my thinking is that my claim, I have no proof whatsoever, is that those accreted terrains are somehow stopping the slab from doing anything. I don't know what the mechanism is, uh, but it's somehow, I don't know if the slab's getting all crumpled up or if there's nothing to this at all. I don't know if it's stopping the watering process. I don't know if the slabs themselves are also kind of chunked down there and are kind of too different. There's a, you know, rocks can melt and solidify at different temperatures and pressures and so some are harder than others to melt and do physical work on so maybe that's having an impact i i'm not exactly sure i would think at those temperatures and pressures it shouldn't matter but maybe there's something happening like the the juan de fuca slabs being crumpled up or slowed down or something but there's no volcanoes where that you would think just in the steady step of those uh, increments between the volcanoes that there should be a couple there, but there aren't. And instead, just to the West, there are these accreted terrains. You're welcome world. I'm done. Okay. <laughs> I'm back. What? <laughs> no. Uh, you have no idea because this is an audio recording. How long lasting and wide in expanse was my smile during all of this because <laughs> I'm thinking this is why the dawdler's philosophy is a thing. You know, <laughs> it's, it's wonderful that we have like, don't be embarrassed. <laughs> Just like you know, I'm sitting over here with geologics envy because I'm like, yeah, whatever. I can just say all this random shit about, we can fix heat death. Or what, you know. <laughs> and you have a manageable sized problem and some reasonable speculation about said problem. And it like, I don't know. It's, I liked it. It was fun and great. I'm going to attempt to see what parts of it Old Weather and I understood and didn't. <laughs> Lo I, <love> it. <laughs> <laughs> I think in general I didn't understand it. But... Let me, you know, say some things, and then you can correct and add and whatever. Okay. So you're talking about a relatively small geographical region that you're relatively familiar with. Yeah. But that you think that this region is a good exemplar of a potential geologic principle that is either under or not yet appreciated or explained, to your knowledge, in Earth Science 2018... And maybe you could use your theory about what's happening in Pacific Northwest to establish a general principle about the way rocks, water, heat, tectonic motion, etc. influence each other. Is that kind of the ballpark we're playing in? Yeah, I think that's kind of the ballpark we're playing in. The small-minded version is just, hey, I want to see if it's going on here you know the bigger picture thing might be able to say yeah what happens when you interfere with subducting slabs and you know convergence zones and plate tectonics you know does that create some kind of an effect on where volcanoes might come up to the surface or not uh but in general it's just a you know oh i got a case and i'm gonna solve the case kind of science you know what i mean it's a little bit i think more in that uh, vein, but definitely, I mean, if it, if, I mean, it, physical systems, wonderful thing about them is that for the most part, you can kind of apply their, you know, their principles, you know, whatever, whatever you figure out, you can try and apply it elsewhere and see if it is 
uh, generalizable. Is the anomaly in question the distribution of volcanic pimples on the face of Earth? Yeah, totally. Great one. <laughs> okay. Given the location of these other volcanoes and the pattern of their dispersal, we would expect there to be some volcanoes in this region, but we don't see any. No. And that's the question that, I know that Ryan is attempting to address with his answer. We don't see them here because this is an accretion zone and the somehow the act of accretion has influenced and inhibited the emergence of a volcano. Yeah. Is that right? That's it. Okay. Yep. Yep. And then, so, all right. Idiot humans who aren't earth scientists, when we think about melting things, we think about ice cubes, maybe plastic, at most something like sandbox sand, whatever. We don't think about what appear to human being scale interactions, rocks, hard stuff, uh -huh. as being a candidate for a melting process. But that's just because we don't know the field, right? Rocks melt too, uh -huh. is one of your points. Was yeah. another of your points, I thought I had this and then you changed it later, that the amount of saturation through a layer of rock, the amount of water in it, changes its melting point? Or some, I'm sure that's poorly phrased. Was there anything like that? Say that one more time. <laughs> the amount of water in a certain layer of rock yeah. changes its melting point? Yeah. Okay, that's right. So that if we envision a rock layer like a kitchen sponge or something, that it has a certain amount of water in it, and that can it can slowly evaporate over the day, or you can spray some water on it and it'll soak that up, or you can set it on top of some water and it'll soak that up, whatever. That the amount of water in the sponge is always changing through various factors. One of the factors that can change the amount of water in it is if you bring your biology textbook in and set it on top of the sponge, right? That yeah. you weigh it down and change the pressure so then water will probably come out. It will be pressed out and it will go on your countertop. Mm -hmm. So is that at all analogous to what you're suggesting might be the case with an accretion zone? Some other geologic factor causes a heavy weight to be placed on top of some rock layer, which then pushes out some of the water, which then makes it harder to melt, therefore harder to turn into a volcano. You mean before it reaches like deeper into the mantle? I don't know. Is that what I mean? Well, <laughs> would I mean that that, me? I, that would be interesting. Um, but I'm I don't just know. like I'm just going off of as a hundred percent ignoramus about this, trying to figure out what you were saying and trying to analogize it to things I'm more familiar with and whatever. Right. Yeah. So uh, let's see. Uh, it, it, it wouldn't be the case if it was deeper into the mantle because that would be doing the that would be the right effect. Whereas I want you know I don't know if somehow the accreted terrain was able to kind of release water, uh, release the you know help add pressure without the temperature change necessarily to release the water from the slab before it actually gets down, um, you know and I um but I'm not uh I, I mean that would be interesting I don't I don't know. But the big thing, the big question mark is what's happening specifically that, I mean, I just have a pattern and that more or less the claim, because I can't really, I don't have a good argument. You know, a good argument would be something like you're, like I'm kind of extrapolating or turning into, would be like, oh, well, it's the accretive terrain and it has this effect on the plate before it has a chance. It's still getting subducted, but it doesn't have any water by then. It's not melting anything, you know, or something like that. That would be like. You know, I'd have an argument because I'd have these maybe uh, separate theoretical or evidentiary premises that I'd be applying to the thing. And then therefore, and I could do that. I don't have any of that. I just am like, look at that pattern. It's because of that thing, you know, <laughs> which is sort of like that guy shot him. You know, I saw him and he didn't, I didn't like his face, you know, <laughs> whatever. Uh, <clears throat> that's where. I th Can you restate the claim 
that you believe but cannot prove given my periphrastic addendums and whatever and what we've got now like what is even the claim um the claim is that um uh two it's funny i don't know how else to phrase them outside of just the the name given to them <laughs> because i don't think people understood that that was something possible really until after the 1970s when we finally kind of accepted plate tectonics <laughs> so it's kind of a new thing and now we have this accreted terrains it's like um so i'll just say these gaps in the relatively regular intervals between volcanoes in a volcanic arc that i'm talking about the cascade one are related causally to these large terrains that were i <laughs> god jesus um, I'm trying to figure out a way to say it. Is it related to the patterns of accreted terrains? Yeah, but I don't know if accreted terrain is what you want me to change the vocabulary of. So I'm trying to think, like, oh, do I need to change that? Or is accreted terrain... Oh, no, yeah. Sense? I mean, I'm fine with that as okay. of now. And I think I get that claim. The The gaps are somehow related to the accreted terrains. And the okay. gaps are uh, relatively larger distances between... Um, volcanoes than the average distance or something yep not knowing anything about the state of play in this particular science i wouldn't even know what the alternative hypotheses are or if there are any or if you're the first or only person to think of that one or what i have no idea but it's again if you want prima facie reasonableness to an ignoramus you got it I'm like, sure, that sounds fine. At least it could be. I think it's worth looking into. Yeah. I mean, there are like accretionary processes that happen related to the actual subducting slab itself. Because, I mean, there's going to be friction. And, I mean, these two major things are ramming into each other. You're going to get some interesting additional dynamics at the contact zone. Um, you know, but uh, this is sort of a, a separate thing. and I, and I've been trying to find stuff kind of loosey-goosey because, you know, one has many projects. And this is one where every once in a while I'll take a look. And I haven't found anything related to that, you know, in my relatively light searches. But I don't doubt that somebody would, if I talk to somebody who studies these kinds of subducting dynamics or whatever, that they wouldn't have at least some kind of potential answer but i i don't know maybe not you know maybe you know we're all maybe geologists are just caught up in a lot of other stuff right now and it's it's just you know it, as i said i mean it's really the 70s which isn't too long ago uh not too much you know beyond our lifetime i think it was 1971 i think when f the plate tectonics was finally like okay you know looks like the plates are moving around the uh Planet. and that really wow yeah like talk you know another dark ages type thing i didn't know it was that fresh it's that fresh in terms of the community saying oh like you know the you know climate change people being like oh you know like this is you know all climate scientists are like yeah it's happening and everyone at else. one point plate tectonics yeah. was like morphogenetic resonance morph uh resonance or what yeah yeah <laughs> he is now like what's his name um uh the guy who came up with the idea um alfred wegner you know he was a meteorologist and he was doing something not too dissimilar to i guess i did just looking at a map you know and he just noticed that the the continents seemed to kind of fit together a little and so then he started to do more in, you know going into that but there's a lot of people like the guy who's with the missoula floods uh, an area you'll be driving through at some point relatively soon. He, this guy, um, J. Harlan Bretz, you know, he just, you know, without, like, without having all the information, came to this conclusion that there was a really giant flood from all of the geological mapping and research that he was doing in that area of eastern Washington state. Anyway, it really isn't until later when we're flying in our Cessnas over the thing that we go, oh, yeah, wow, look, you can kind of see waves in the land, <laughs> you know, like, because there's all this other material that's been deposited because of the glaciers. It's called lurse. 
and it's a really fine powder and you have it i'm sure potentially in minnesota where you are but in uh, in particular quite a bit was dumped in the washington state and so when you know a large body of water flows over some pretty light material like lurs um which is really really again like flour you know um it, it just totally created these <laughs> ripples that you can see from above they're giant ripples because the flooding was huge and the similar thing they did quite a bit of uh they call it paleomagnetism and um it has to do with the way that when the uh, magnetic poles shift in the earth um you know the uh, particular kinds of uh, uh mineral alignments are in a particular direction because of the iron content that they have and so they're able to look at you know the way that it changed and that that allowed them to finally put the sort of last kind of like oh okay it looks like things really are moving because you could see the shifts moving away from these um mid-ocean ridges which are um they sometimes call them spreading zones um anyway if you think of the earth like a baseball with the you know the stitching those would be like the spreading zones maybe but it was like my advisor beat out another um like an australian guy for the job that he had his whole career and it was in 1978 the year i was born is the first year he started his tenure track professorship anyway uh he beat that guy out because that guy was an expanding earth guy which wasn't too crazy, you know what I mean? Like it, it was like, oh yeah, I mean it's still out there, but for the most part, the you mean know, like the diameter of Earth is increasing all the time? Yeah, and that explains the patterns of ocean crust and continental crust. And so there's this idea that it's just, you know it's expanding, and so there are these little cracks that are forming as it expands. And so that was mm -hmm. one of the models. But the other model was that they're moving because of some internal convectional type dynamics potentially in the earth's core you know uh, i mean at the earth's core but you know below the surface of the earth between you know this idea of a, an internal dynamo where you've got a you know core an outer core like inner core outer core mantle and then that's all moving the crust so are the expanding earth people hollow earth people no, I don't think so, but I can't... Because that brings me to my next claim, no <laughs> <laughs> You're like, there's mushrooms and dinosaurs down there, damn it. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, that's uh, that's that was my thing. I... Yeah, it's beautiful, and it's a wonderful contrast, and it's just... Yeah. Mm -hmm. It is a contrast, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> Jesus Christ. So that's that's something that I think that I don't know. I don't really have any way to put it. You know, I mean, I don't have any way to support it. I just see the pattern and I'm like, that's to blame. But nonetheless. Sounded good to me. All right. And now for something completely different. Excellent. Most institutions in 2018 America are very low on the scale of meritocracy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you had me at meritocracy. <laughs> <laughs> I would agree. I've got all kinds of cynical, negative, misanthropic, depressive comments about humanity, about Earth, and especially about the society I'm stuck in here in America. And that's one of them i since i don't really care too much about chimpanzee politics i'd rather think about fixing heat death than think about electing octavio cortez or whatever but um so that's maybe there are good arguments for this or maybe i think there would be but i this one might be too personal i certainly don't know them i just feel this way most of the time that um everything from our arts to our politics to our academy 
I don't think meritocracy plays a very big role in most of our institutions. It's more likely something irrelevant and unrelated that causes or influences one's rise in their chosen domain of endeavor. Yeah, I am confident um, that if you did try and support that claim, that it wouldn't be long until you were able to. Mm -hmm. I Obviously, that may be another claim like a sub claim or a, a tangential one or something, but yeah, <laughs> I, I am like, I'm pretty, I, cause I have run across that m on multiple occasions, I think. And I don't, I don't file that shit away. I just am like, yep, that confirms all of my belief. Confirmed. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like I accept. Um, uh, and, and it might, and maybe it's foolish too, but I, I'm pretty confident that's how it works. Isn't there a whole branch now of economists and financial people who essentially are concerned that what is happening right now is that essentially the wealth is being consolidated in sort of the inheritance uh, uh, areas of, you know, our, our society and the inheriting areas. So like, you know, you got you know that's being hoarded yeah hoarded don trump jr and then his kids will get the next amount and the, you know like it'll just it's it's being passed on and it's not being it's going you know uh what am i trying to say vertically it's not going horizontally by any stand mm -hmm. and so i thought that there's an actual concern that that is also an exacerbating effect to this you know dying middle class this greater you know um gap between the rich and the poor and all that kind of stuff i that's why i'm kind of confident that you wouldn't if you went and really looked and tried to tally it all up and uh work it out that you would probably find that would be your most successful support to whatever the claim is yeah well because merit merit is very horizontal right mm -hmm. so to the extent that one can provide arguments that current American society is virtually orthogonal in its wealth distribution, that it's very vertical, then uh, that would be support for this claim, I guess. I think it's up against, though, you know, that kind of, I almost want to say in an evolutionary sense, it's kind of like up against some kind of like kin selection forcing, you know, in that it obviously isn't about survival or anything, but it's definitely, you know, okay, I, you know, I really appreciated your parent and you're, you are interested in some of the same things as I am, even though your parent and I didn't do the same thing. Like your parent was a nuclear physicist and I'm a journalist and you're into journalism. Yeah, come work for my paper. Like it just, I get that. Like you get these breaks. You're no better than anyone else. You may even be a lot worse maybe because in part you didn't really have to work for it because your life has been one s sequence of these kind of events, one following the next, you know? And then of course the wealth thing, it's just wealth is a factor that uh, paves its own way a lot of times. So I don't know. I, I, I yeah, that one seems a, a slam dunk to me in a way, mm. but to me it does. I don't know if it is. It seems like a lot of times a lot of people who, at least on the re Republican side of our co our country's politics, they seem to t to really declare uh, the whole idea the you know pull yourself up by your bootstraps meritocracy stuff. But they seem just like any other group of wealthy people to be providing opportunities for those that have inherited the capacity to receive them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we're done. Yeah, so this might have been a bad example on the dimension of can't be well argued, at least according to Ryan. He's like, yeah, that one, not only do I agree with it, I think it can be argued. Yeah. I mean, you don't have an argument for it. And that's, I think, the criteria to... Yeah, it. so it got all back to the the you question. Like, well, I can't argue for it, but maybe there are good arguments. But... 
you know, right. there are plenty of people, I think, who would disagree with us about this. Most libertarians and contemporary conservatives, right, are under the mythos that the American dream is still a thing. Oh, yeah. Well. And maybe they're right. I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> I don't care about this. I give up. All right. So let's go back in time in order to go... Let's go back to the future. Ooh. Because in my lifetime, as a Gen X millennial cusper, nobody cares or thinks or talks about this anymore. But Because I missed it by 15, 20 years. But if we go back a little bit, there were people thinking about the future positively, such as Tim Leary with his smile meme, uh, which stands for space migration, intelligence increase, and life extension. Mm. I think the dream of Tim Leary's smile is possible for human beings. Tempered by a bunch of George Carlin-esque <laughs> defeatism that probably we've missed our chance and fucked it up and, you know, it's all over now. But there's n no good reasons, I don't think, that prevented humanity from being out of this little gravity well and into the rest of the universe, being able to become smarter to an indefinite extent and to live forever. Aging seems like a medical problem that can be fixed. We don't seem to spend nearly enough. We don't invest in this problem. But, as I'm sure somebody said before, I don't know how to properly attribute it, but there is a mortal illness that every human being has, and it doesn't get funding. You were talking about in a previous episode the cancer moonshots and whatnot. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, why don't we shoot the moon on aging? Motherfucking everybody is dying. <laughs> we're all dying, and nobody's trying to fix it. Yeah. It's all... It's... But anyway, there's a claim I, I accept but cannot prove. Aging is fixable. Earth is escapable. And there's no end to human intelligence. I I just like that. Like, who would be like, no, I don't want that. I want to well, die. Well, apparently almost everyone, because we <laughs> don't invest very much in any of these domains. We're cutting back more and more and more on space exploration. Aubrey de Grey is still some poor homeless guy, judging by his beard. <laughs> Like this stuff, we're not doing any of this, and obviously people are getting dumber. Mm. But yeah, so I guess we missed the boat. Maybe there was a chance at some point. I don't know. I don't see any of this happening, but I also don't see a reason it couldn't. I I, I just feel the need to remind you <laughs> that I've read books by this person, and uh, that person's name is Peter Turchin, and his Cleo Dynamics. And the idea that if he is onto something, that society moves in cycles, that this is a down phase and we'll have an upswing, and that, you know, we just, we have upswings and downswings in our society, and right now we're just on the downswing. It doesn't... Okay, it, that's cool. It, well, it doesn't help that we're coinciding with, like, all our great terrors of climate change and environmental destruction, and who knows what that means then for these cycles right they can be disrupted we better not swing too far down or it won't come back up you mean yeah you know we might bottom out the pendulum hits the table and we don't get another tick well i who knows with with the effects of climate change what'll will occur how that will have an impact um however big that impact might be but definitely not because of the information I read on social media or because of the memories I have of learning this stuff, but because of just my, you know, summer to summer experiences. I'm like, holy fuck, 
You know, I, I'm the kind of person, and I, my neighbor said this the other day, or the other day, the, this summer. We were talking about the heat, and, we, you know, she, she was just like, I'm a heat-loving person. Like, yeah, set me in the, the warm weather, in a sort of tropical environment, and I love it. And I'm just like, yeah, me too. But this is kind of, like, pathetic. You know, like, this is this is different kind of heat. This is kind of, like, incessant, persistent, nonstop kind of heat. And it's not even, like, a fun cultural thing. It's just like a <laughs> fucking goddamn... No, the, none of the plants can, like, handle it. You know what I mean? It's weird. It's not like they're adapted. And you know, they're like, oh, I'll figure it out. You know, like, it, all the trees around here, like, they fucking... You know, they change the color too soon and they lose their leaves soon. And they're just, they all look like they're just like never enough water. And like, well, you know, droughts happen. And it's like, yeah, but this is like, this is, this is the different kind of drought. This is kind of a longer lasting one. All the people I know who, who've lived here their whole lives are like, yeah, it used to rain. (laughs) You know, (laughs) that's what they say. They're like, it used to rain. I'm like, wow. Uh, Anyway. I know that happened in one of my Portland living years that it's that was the reputation is that there was tons of rain and then all winter was brown and like it's not happening you guys are full of shit yep. but it used to it used to really be intense you know and you know just constant and even when I would visit my brother when he lived here before me I remember being like wow everything's just soggy and moldy and just you know like you can never get dry Like it's that kind of feeling and it makes sense to me while everyone, why everyone around here has this habit of just have it. Um, everyone has this tendency to just, (laughs) everyone has this tendency to light their fireplaces, you know, like to, to get it going. Like I'm always smelling fireplaces and even when it's like not really cold and raining and I'm like, I think that's just like, I'll say it. I think it's just a habit of some people who've like, you know, really lived through the rain. Are we blabbering on at this point? Is that what this has become? And we're just like, blah, 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 blah. Well, I can't get you to disagree with me about anything. And I'm like, this topic was tailor-made for me to get radical and say crazy shit. At some point, I need to push a button. So it appears not to have happened so far. Maybe the 4.4 listeners all really, really have a problem with you. But kind of like... They said about well, how, I'm sure they do, well, but, but they need to but kind of fucking send me an email. Well, or that's something. it. Yeah, kind of like like uh, they said about Howard Stern. They're like, I'm so mad at him, but I just got to hear what he says next. It's appalling. Everybody better be appalled. So check out this fucking shit that comes next. Oh my god! I'm going to appall everybody, maybe even you. Oh, and I'm just going to say it in a provocative manner. Okay, mathematics is an arbitrary human construction, an accident. There is no truth to it. We developed the math and science we did primarily because of the contingencies of our evolutionary embodiment and that there are an indefinite number of alternative coping strategies that are entirely distinct from that which we now have. I'm I'm really tempted to just end the episode right there. Just like go right into some rock song. Just like bam, you know. <sighs> I might. I might. Um I uh and this is one of those things where you like you're confident beyond your ability to argue for it, is that Yes. <laughs> I mean that this question is built for people like me that enjoy Pushing the envelope. <laughs> yes, it is. It sure Most is. Most people, in my experience, tend to do almost the opposite of this one, and some of the respondents to this edge question did the opposite of this one. They were saying that their belief that they couldn't prove is all intelligent aliens will have converged upon our math. And so that that would be right. the template, the codex, on which we can have and build our confederation. Uh-huh. At least we'll have the same fucking math. And I tend, <laughs> I have the habit of feeling the inverse. I think that human math 
is a complete arbitrary accident that is what it is because we've got five fingers or whatever. It's just a total fucking construction. <laughs> and that there might be who knows how many alternative coping mechanisms that would facilitate architecture and moonshots. And you, you can do what you want to do with all sorts of different symbolic constructions. And I don't think that math is a universal language. I think it's a total parochial accident. I don't know if this is going to delight you or make you scoff. Define math. That confluence of symbols and rules that consists extensively primarily of what we call numbers in their many different flavors and they while well, we keep adding more different types of numbers and whatever but numbers and the rules for their manipulation so it is that is a, accepted by some citadel of priests you know whatever the ma those who are called mathematicians by our social institutions whatever they think <laughs> the rules are mathematicians yeah uh -huh. um Oh, now I'm just thinking of cartoonish guys with white beards and like pointy hats with stars and crescent moons on them. So it's a formal system. Yep. Okay. There's no informal system mathematics. I don't think so. I don't know exactly what you mean. But, you know, in development of an organism or something like that, you know, algorithms, uh, telling things to stop, you know, like, you know, uh, bilateral symmetry like you know geometry oh yeah you mean like the you know patterns the eric yonch types where they got the shell cut in half on the cover of their book with all the patterns and oh look there's fibonacci in the sunflowers and all that kind of stuff well just the idea that there's potentially in the molecular information exchange processes some kind of counting you know something says well stop here and it does that on a rel relatively consistent basis. I'm not saying that there's something deep down that it isn't just like, well, it just happened to stop there. But that in general, once you have like, okay, make three, then you can have make four, make five. You know, like you can have little accidents. We'll go back to two, you know, like, but then, you know, obviously I don't, I'm not saying we aren't putting on with our language or in spoken language or natural language, whatever you want to call it. I'm not saying we're not – overlaying something on top of that in order to communicate with each other about it, but that there might be some natural tendency to have numbers, to have addition, to have what subtraction. What about I don't this know. phrasing? Is this what you're saying? Uh, are you saying, Harland, are you denying that there are patterns of behavior? <laughs> And I, no. No, I wouldn't say I was I'm, asking you that. That's not but, what you mean? No. That, that's basically what I'm hearing when you say that certain things grow, in they have habits of growth, etc. There's patterns in behavior, yeah. Right, and, and don't those patterns include some form of numbers, counting, etc.? You know, even if that ca counting is simply a pattern, like when you think about genetics... You know, there's like a stop molecule, you know, and so it's like boom, 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 stop. And then, you know what I mean? Like there's an algorithm, there's there's a rhythm to it. And I would just think that the way I always see math thrown around, it's very loose. It's sort of like, yeah, there's there's a, you know, there's a sort of inherent sort of natural component in math uh, or I mean, in natural phenomena that already kind of or, or, uh, embodies or contains those things that we just then, you know, using our symbols and language, just call out. This kind of wraps into some of the earlier claims, I guess. If we rephrase your critique attempt as being something about, well, do you think there are algorithmic behavior patterns? That that's a lot like a law of nature, right? A uh, given certain inputs, one will get certain outputs. That's the 
bumper sticker of an algorithm, right? A reliable derivation method for if you see X, you will get Y. I think there are those, but I don't think that they are essential, fixed, and eternal, but might be viable. Yeah, I guess what I'm trying to say is, is, is our formal system just simply derived from a, an informal uh, system? The idea that there's oh yeah patterns at all, that there's patterns seeking, you know, nervous systems out there mm -hmm. that collect information and process it. To me, that almost seems like uh, has an element of I, I I don't know. I mean, it seems like it could have an element of number crunching. You know, um, maybe it's not explicit in the sense that I am going to count right now on my hand one, two, three, four, five fingers. You know, or you know wh whatever, or or do the addition and and say, oh, I've got five fingers on one hand, five fingers there. I got ten fingers. You know, like that's kind of an explicit way of doing it. But that is it possible that mathematics is we can use the word to apply to informal things, or should we restrict the idea of mathematics to this formal system idea? You know, where yeah, it is the thing that we construct; it is the symbols we put together, and that they then formulate or produce some uh, plan, you know, upon which you can revisit and use and that it it has its own kind of you know inputs and outputs and all that kind of stuff that's what i was trying mm -hmm. to say so if it's all just you know math if i agree with you if we are only talking about math being a formal system thing that's it but if math also has potential to have other aspects to it that is informal and that is something that we sort of see as sort of you know the the actual math that we tend to think about one plus one equals two being in a derived thing from something more inherent, then I would say no. I thought I knew where you were going, and then at the very end, you lost me again. Oh, I lost because you because I, I disagree. To say both of those things. Yes, I think that our if so it, to do the normative semantics part. I'm not making. I don't want to adjudicate that whole thing right now. But should the token quote M A T H unquote. <laughs> refer to mere symbolic manipulation or the entire general process of applying metrics to patterns in the physical universe or what you know whatever the options are i'm not trying to get into that i want to agree with you if you're saying isn't it the case that our symbol system version of math is what it is because we are the type of animal we are that's i'm all about that that's the whole five finger counting whatever point well i, I was think trying I'm to missing something you're saying well maybe i'll say it this way maybe there's there is something to count when there is someone to count it you know there is but that if you don't have something to count it is it still countable and if that oh, is okay. the case, yeah. oh. <laughs> if that is the case, then is it possible that what, you know, then th is it possible that math is something kind of in the general sense inherent to at least, you know, we could say biological systems or something because they seem so pattern driven. I just keep my brain keeps going back to the geometry of flowers, you know, or sea stars or you know what i mean like it seems or there's the whole fractal dendritic patterns in trees or veins or rivers and streams and things like that. like there are all these patterns and you know is that a is that a, is there a quality there that is mathematical and that we then formalize that in our own way and is that what people are trying to say is that the universe is mathematical because they're saying there are these patterns and we formalize them, but there are essentially these things out there, and all we're doing is just saying, you know, putting symbols to what we are claiming to be seeing or observing or detecting, whatever. Could is this related to the potential question? Were there fractals in nature before humans invented recursion? Like, is that the kind? Like, 
that could be a question, I, Mike. I, yeah, I mean, yeah, basically. Before, it, you know, humans invented, quote-unquote, recursion or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Are there those patterns in nature? And is that pattern maybe what, mathematical, or are we restricting math simply to the formal systems we create? Maybe in these terms, the way to phrase this claim attempt would be something like, the whatever humans choose to employ as their symbolic habits doesn't affect the objective nature of the reality what you know nature just is what it is however we choose to talk about it or represent it or if we if i'm allowed to use the phrase cope with it whatever we put in our math textbooks doesn't change the shape and pattern of the veins in the leaves, but that there are an indefinite number of potential ways to cope with the way that the veins are arranged in the leaves. So that's just the natural objective phenomena. The, the leaf is what it is, but that there are different sets of concerns and projects that different species might have regarding leaves and that human beings happened to develop a mathematics in the sense of a symbolic construct social construction that included concepts like fractals that then we go look at the leaves and we notice some sort of apparent correspondence like oh it looks like the veins in these leaves uh, this nature segment co-responds to our conceptual construction of a fractal, isn't that amazing? And wow, wow, now we've discovered something about nature versus the zoomed out meta perspective of who knows how many different ways there are to construct symbol systems that tell you something interesting about leaves. I don't know, this is getting far out and hard to say but did any of that make sense yeah i i have a question though and if depending on your answer it will make more or less sense i suppose is saying what you're saying about math and leaves being you know it is what it is kind of thing is it similar to saying there is no english in the leaves um like, you know, I mean... Is math... Yeah. <laughs> is... <laughs> is... Uh, math... Like... If we can use math to explain the leaf, and we can use English to explain the leaf, but it doesn't change the leaf. The leaf is the leaf. There's no English right. in the leaf. There's no math in the leaf. Is that what you're saying? Are you equating math well, to English? I mean, I would say that, but that's not the point of this. That's just trivially true. <laughs> what I'm trying to say is like, well, it, it goes back to my whole thing about even if there's no one to count, is the thing countable? Meaning, does it have uh, an inherent kind of numerical quality or what have you i mean does it have an algorithmic does it have a you know we were saying pattern before does that pattern is there something you can do with it um and is that particular thing that you would do with it tend to be math as we talk about it and as other people want to say other aliens would also do would they also go to the leaf and count up the veins or come up with fractal geometry or is that something just uh, we would do like is what you're saying akin to me being like, no, aliens don't speak English, you know, or is it, you know what I'm saying? I'm trying to get to the, to the, what's the analogy or the analogous thing that you could be saying? Yeah, of course, not every damn alien out there would be speaking English. They may not communicate using vocal cords at all or what, you know what I mean? Is that what you're trying to say? English or language as we are using it, talking and breathing and doing all our stuff, vocal cords, all the whole apparatus specific to us, or, you know, maybe even to some extent, you know, some birds say stuff sometimes. I've heard some dogs go, I love you, but yeah, that's YouTube. <laughs> um, 
but is that specific to this planet and some of the particular lineages that evolved there and some other planet they might not even communicate in that way and so it's is math like that like that's just something we came up with because we have the apparatus to do it is math like english or language you know speaking and using your vocal cords to communicate in the way that we do let's see if this helps i think that it's similar to not necessarily a language but a grammar like the things like being addable or countable is kind of like there being a subject predicate metaphysics in a grammar okay and that that doesn't mean that's how the universe works that there are things with properties because that's how english works because our math works on there being finite distinguishable bounded entities that are countable doesn't mean that that's how the universe works or that that's the only way to chop things up or the only way to cope with it I, anyway i'm glad that at least this one <laughs> was a little bit you know hard to grasp and deal with and yeah made some friction uh, I and I don't even know what I'm saying, but that's the whole point of this. I, you know, I think so. Pushed envelope. The whole point um, is to show you, Harlan, that you don't know what you're talking about. Oh well, that's easy enough. Shit, that's been evinced Fucking since episode zero. Doddlers is over. Then no. Um. All right. Well, is this that time of the night? There used to be a rule where there's no new ideas after two hours. I know. So that means. That I successfully saved my major claim that I believe but cannot prove. What? So that it can still be a totally separate one? episode. Oh, yeah. I mean, and this is my favoritest and biggest one. Oh, my God. But we can't deal with it now because we're after two hours. Well, and uh, yeah, Jesus. So I only get to provide a little taste. No, no, just say it and we'll end on that. You want to say anything before it ends? Communication is the most foundational interaction type in the universe.